and I want to welcome everyone to Night Matters. We're super honored and excited to have Ada Blair here today speaking about the fear of the dark, which is always one of my favorite, favorite, favorite topics in the dark sky movement as a whole, because I've really felt that we can teach people about lighting, we can teach them about environmental impacts and safety, but really, really, really deep down, we're all kind of afraid of the dark and we have to face that fear as a society and change our perception about darkness as bad. And that's really one of the roots of the issues that I've found. And so I'm really excited Ada is going to be addressing this today, especially around this spooky season. We should have had this be a costume night matters, but uh, next year we can do that. And uh, I just have a couple announcements before we get started with the presentation. So I would really encourage everyone here to join us for our Under One Sky Conference, which is coming up November 3rd and 4th. It is a 24 hour extravaganza of awesome dark sky presentations. And we do have registration this year. We're using a brand new platform. So it's gonna be a little more professionalized than just joining a Zoom meeting. There's a landing page. You log in, you can update your profile, you can chat with other people, there's discussion boards, there's instant networking, there's video chat rooms, there's all this fun stuff, there's some gamification, you can score points for attending sessions and asking questions and uh, we're really excited about it this year. So please register and Michael is our link master today and is gonna pop the link to the conference website in the chat. We finally have all the speakers on the website as well. So you can check out the full lineup of speakers and just really hoping to see you there. We're super excited about it. So that's what I've been focusing on mainly. And I think that's my main announcement for everyone here. Also, I'm here with Susan. Susan, would you like to say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Susan Charnello, um, the membership director. I recognize a lot of your names and so great to meet you over Zoom. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And we are taking over for Allison today because she is road tripping and is in middle of nowhere, New Mexico, but has still managed to join us as well. So welcome, Allison, and thank you for entrusting us with the Night Matters. It's an honor to be here with all of you. So I will go ahead and introduce Ada, and then we are, can hear her presentation. So let me pull up. Oh, I have it pulled up. Where is it? Sorry. And just real quick, while Betty Maya is getting everybody pulled up, we do have uh, translated captions. If you would like, you can turn those on down below. Um, and make sure you turn off your cameras and your microphones as soon as the presentation starts. Oh, yeah, I forgot. The best part is please pop a chat, a hello in the chat with where you're calling in from. And to, Susan and I are here in Tucson, Arizona, where we were talking about it's still 100 degrees, which means it's 100 percent hot. And <laughs> I'm hoping that you're all enjoying this fall or spring season wherever you are. So without further ado, Ada Blair lives in the Scottish borders and is a psychotherapist, group facilitator, and trainer working in higher education, the not-for-profit sector, and private practice. A fascination with Carl Jung's ideas led to her training in transpersonal psychology, psychosynthesis, and eco-psychology. She also holds an MA in cultural astronomy and astrology. So cool. She believes that while therapy can help us be in a more harmonious relationship with the different aspects of ourselves, much disease can come from a sense of disconnection from the natural world. Forming a relationship with the natural world, including the sky, can help make sense of our emotions and life experiences. She is the author of Sark in the Dark, Well-Being and Community on the Dark Sky Island of Sark. So there we go. We have had Ada present with us many times before, and she's amazing. So super excited to have her here again. I'll spotlight her video and let you take it away. Thank you, Ada. Well, that was a very kind introduction. Thank you very much. I feel that's a lot, a, a lot to live up to now, <laughs> but I'll do my best. So I'm going to share my screen with you in a minute. I'm less familiar with screen sharing on Zoom than I am on Teams. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it should be okay. 
So thanks very much for inviting me. And I'm just, without further ado, going to start screen sharing. So hopefully first slide should appear in a sec. Let me just call this up. OK, so let's just get rid of that bit. <laughs> That's it. Lovely. So good evening, everybody. I'm saying good evening because from my part of the world, it is evening. Yeah, just so you know, we're seeing just like the whole um, PowerPoint yeah, whole thing with the slides anyway. on the side. Yeah. All right. So shall, let me see how I can get it to be. I'll go to slideshow. That's probably the easiest way to do it then. Yeah, and if you do from if you do from beginning. Uh... Okay, here we go. There we go. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Sorry about that. I'm a bit of an obvious with this. So today I'm I'm going to talk about fear of the dark, and it feels like a very big topic and a topic I'm I'm very interested in, and I would go so far as to say been interested in since I was a very very young child. Because I myself, early on in life, suffered from insomnia. Still do to some extent, but really early on in life, I was insomniac. So I started off life being awake a lot during the night. And for quite a long time, that was a night that I was frightened of. But through the years, I became less and less fearful. So it's, it's been with me throughout my life, this, this topic of fear of the dark. So in my presentation tonight, I'm going to try and cover a few different themes. I'm going to look into this idea of, is it an evolutionary trait? Have humans always been scared of the dark? Is it part of our, our genes, our genetics, or, or something else? So we'll cover that. I'll also take a look at our experiences of the dark in childhood and what happens as we as we progress into adulthood? Do we continue to be scared of the dark or does something shift? And I'll bring in a little bit about my experiences from the dark sky island of Sark in the Channel Islands, because I did quite a few interviews back there when I was writing Sark in the Dark. And on some of the things that people said there about living in a dark sky island, I think are really quite pertinent to our topic tonight. And I'll touch a little bit on two phobias. One of them you have probably heard of, maybe the second one perhaps not so familiar with, nyctophobia and astrophobia. Say more about that later. And then if there's time at the end, talk a little bit about this idea of are there, is there more crime at night? Are there more accidents? Is there anything to base those fears on? because that's often linked to why people are scared of being out at night. So those are my broad themes for tonight. So let's, let's take a look first of all at, I'm going to state something really obvious, but I think it's important to mention it right at the beginning. So when we talk about dark, there's the dictionary definitions of dark, and here's just a few that I've pulled up from the Cambridge Dictionary. Dark means little or no light. It also has the, the meaning of some, something that's evil or threatening or something that's secret or hidden. So these are broadly speaking, the kind of definitions you'll find if you look in a dictionary and you look up dark. But the, the key thing I wanna pull out here is there's dark and there's dark skies. So we can be in a house and it can be dark. We can be indoors and it can be dark. And that's, that's different from being outdoors in the dark, under a dark sky. So it's probably stating the obvious, but I just wanted to, to make that, that distinction between dark and darkness, which can be indoors or outdoors and dark sky. And I'll be kind of covering both tonight, although the focus will be on the dark skies. And little Halloweeny picture because we're almost there, a couple of weeks to go. 
so taking a second just to go to this idea of the evolutionary trait. There's a man who, whose work I, I really respect, and you might have come across him, A. Roger Erkich. Not sure if that's how you pronounce his, his surname. But he, um, he wrote a lot about dark, the history of dark and darkness. And he talked about fear of the dark as being this most ancient of human anxieties. So he's very much pulling out this idea that it's always been around, it's a really core primordial anxiety. And he speculates that maybe, you know, going back to prehistoric times, there was this profound fear. And I quite like this, this idea of amongst, amid the gathering darkness and cold, there was fear because they couldn't be sure the sun would return. And everywhere one looks in the ancient world, it seems to be that demons filled the night air. And Jay Gallinier and, and colleagues spoke about the symbolic role darkness played, particularly in medieval religious societies. Pagan obscurantism, deviancy, monstrosity, diabolism. So there's also been this association for, for centuries with darkness and, and the devil, with deviancy, with with monstrosity, with, with things happening that people were, were afraid of. And going back to Greek mythology, Nyx was the, the primordial goddess of the night. And this is a depiction of her on a, I think it's some kind of urn or vase that's in the Metropolitan Museum. And she's often depicted as wearing some kind of veil or cloak sometimes with stars over it, usually envisaged as a very substance of night. And she drew this veil of dark mist across the sky to obscure the light of Aether, the shining blue of the heavens. And her opposite number in the Greek pantheon was Hemara, goddess of the day, who would scatter the mists at night, of night when dawn came. So she doesn't look particularly frightening there, but some of the depictions I've seen of her, she's a very scary, frightening looking, fierce goddess. And going on with this idea of, is it, is it inevitable? Is it, is it you know, part, part of our, our hardwiring that we should be afraid of the dark? We'll come to that idea of hardwiring in a minute, but I'm sure you've heard of this idea of the reptilian brain, <clears throat> it's often referred to as the oldest layer of our brain. And it's a, it's a part of our brain that's responsible for the flight or flight, fight or flight impulse. And people like Grillian and others, and this, these references I give at the very end of the presentation, spoke about darkness facilitating this this fight or flight response, this startle response in the brain that then increased anxiety. So I guess the idea there that they're putting across is that for many people being in darkness, whether that's indoors or outdoors, precipitates this fight or flight response in the brain. So for many people, we end up feeling stressed or anxious when we're in the dark. And Begley talks about this, you know, following on, it's the same idea, this idea that the brain is wired to flinch first and ask questions later. So when we're presented with a situation where we feel threatened or we feel there's some kind of imminent danger, we don't stand there thinking rationally and calmly about what to do next. Generally, our reptilian brain kicks in and we flinch and do what we need to do, whether it's run or fight or, <clears throat> or maybe even freeze. But fears, whether it's fear of anxiety or other fears, can come from different um, places. It might be that you come from a family where your parents were scared of the dark and you watched and you observed them be frightened 
of the dark and that became hardwired in you. Maybe you had something really upsetting that happened in the dark, either indoors or outdoors. And that again, you associate with darkness. That event becomes linked. And the third way that often our fears can become hardwired is what psychologists often call a process of anchoring. And, and what's meant by that is when you've had some kind of fright or a scare, your brain links the first thing that you see during that event to feeling scared. So I, I've actually had an instance of that myself. I remember <clears throat> one night many years ago, lying in bed, and it wasn't particularly dark, but I looked up at the ceiling and I could see a spider. And I'm not particularly scared of spiders, but this was quite a big one. I looked up at the ceiling, like thinking to myself, well, that's fine, it will be gone by morning. And then next minute it fell or descended somehow, <laughs> ended up on my face. And I freaked out, I screamed. And at the same time, I was looking at a light in the room. And after that, for quite a long time, every time I looked at that room, I had that same flinch response because my brain had anchored the frightening sensation of the spider falling to seeing the light. So that, that's what anchoring is. So I'm just, I'm not kind of saying I necessarily think these are the reasons why we're afraid of the dark or if it's inevitable or it's evolutionary. I'm just putting out some ideas that other people have, have come up with about that. But generally speaking, <clears throat> most of us kind of perhaps recall a point in our childhood where perhaps there was some kind of fear of the dark. For some reason, it doesn't usually kick in until around two, two and a half years, if it's going to kick in at all. And it's considered a normal response during human development. And mostly, this fear is short-lived, we grow out of it. But for some people, it can persist and it can become really problematic and it can become quite a phobia. And Freud, Sigmund Freud, <clears throat> I think, you know, he's, he's had his, his critics over the years, but one of the things I think he was quite, was quite hot and was quite interested in was this idea of phobias. And he was interested in the phobias that children had and he, he reckoned that fear of the dark was one of the first situational phobias. And this is a quote from, from some of his work. While I was in the next room, I heard a child who was afraid of the dark call out, do speak to me, auntie, I'm frightened. Why, what good would that do? You can't see me. And to this, the child replied, if someone speaks, it gets lighter. So in childhood, there's this idea that maybe we might be scared of the dark because children generally during the day spend time with other people. Just in terms of caretaking, they're not often left alone. And at night, that's maybe for some children, the only part of the day they are on their own. So there might be that fear of isolation that's then linked to fear of the dark. And, and whilst it's, as we were saying, it's, it's pretty common amongst children, there's various numbers get put out there, but generally speaking, around about three to 12 year olds, um, probably about three quarters of them are still scared of the dark to some extent. Many adults are also prone to fears of the darkness. And this, um, I can't remember exactly the year this was done. It must have been about 2021, 20, 22. They did a survey and they estimated around 11% of adults were already struggling with this fear before the pandemic in the US. And now COVID-19 for many people seems to have made things worse. When I read that story, I, I, I was quite interested in that because at that point during the COVID pandemic in the UK between sort of 2020 to 2022, March to March, there was a lot of restrictions, really quite 
strict restrictions and a lot of people were not able to see friends and family during the day. There was lots of restrictions about where you could go. So in the town I was living at the time, I noticed that people didn't go out much during the day because there really was quite a fear about bumping into other people and, and getting infected. But it became much more common for people to walk at night. And prior to COVID, it was quite rare in that small town to go out at night and see many people walking alone in the dark. But during the pandemic, I really noticed, because I was doing it myself, I was going out quite a lot for walks in the dark, and I noticed easily an increase of at least four or five fold in people who were walking alone at night. So did it make it worse or not? Who knows? And Gerlin again, same same person spoke about in the previous slide. He also talks about perhaps in, in darkness, the fact that there's less visual stimuli, then for some people that might increase anxiety, uncertainty and tension. And there was a survey done, um, I think it was in 2019, of around 2000 adults in the UK and it found that 40% of them were scared even when walking around their own house with the lights off. Which seems crazy. Even in their own house, even familiar territory, almost half of them were scared walking around. To the extent that one in ten wouldn't even get up to go to the toilet in the darkness. And around half were scared about something unexpected happening. So thinking about the work, um, you know, when we advocate for dark skies and encouraging people to get out and look up, I think we've got to be really mindful of the fact that many people are scared of the dark in their own house, in a safe space. So it might be quite a leap to imagine being outside in a less familiar space, in an uncontained space. I, I find that quite surprising that so many people were so scared of being in the dark in their own house. And there was another survey done, but I'm, <laughs> similar, similar kind of numbers were coming up in this one, but it was done by a lighting supplier. And they were actually coming up with higher percentages of people being scared of the dark, but I'm not convinced they didn't have their own agenda there. And it, it might perhaps be not so much the darkness itself that frightens some people, but the absence of light. Whilst we may think we're scared of the dark because we can't see, perhaps it's something else. And the Glashan from Monash University talks about this idea that we're afraid of the dark because we haven't evolved to be active at night. We've evolved to do most of our activities during the day, in the light, in daylight. And it's not a conscious effect, it's the presence of the light that changes our neurobiology in a way that makes us feel safer, they thought. Whereas nocturnal animals, many of them are actually scared of the light. It might improve their vision, but they feel safer in the dark because they evolved to be active during the dark. So it's not just as simple as whether you can or can't see. Maybe a lot of it does come down to biology. But looking at it from another point of view, people like Tim Edensor and Shepard Bliss, Shepard Bliss, they see darkness in a different way. Bliss sees darkness as transformative. He describes disconnecting from problems when he's outdoors and being able to place himself within the larger context of the Earth's bounty. And Eden Source suggests that darkness and illumination might be loaded with contested values. For some people, um, a, a light night might help them feel safer and happier. But for astronomers, that might not be such a safe, happy place because they look at the dilution, maybe even the disappearance of the nocturnal sky. So for people like Edensor, darkness, he says, is not 
anonymous. It doesn't have to be about superstition, murky thoughts and illicit behaviour, but maybe there's generative potentialities and possibilities. So both of them in their different ways are advocating that, you know, contrary to what our primitive survival mechanisms might be suggesting, darkness can be appreciated and welcomed. We don't have to be a prisoner of our genes, I suppose, of our evolution. And William Shane goes further and suggests that maybe for some people, the excitement that, that goes with being in the dark, that thrill might account for nauticolada, which is enjoyment or love of the night sky. So a different perspective, perhaps. And I thought I'd take a pause here and go in a slightly different direction, thinking I was, as I was writing this presentation, I was wondering about the different films and all kinds of artwork and media over the centuries that feature darkness and dark skies. But I wanted to come up with something that was very recent. And these were the three things that came to mind, recent, recent media. So in the UK, there was a TV series. It was a reality show. And eight celebrities, it was called Scared of the Dark, eight celebrities spend time eating, sleeping, all in complete darkness. And the premise behind the show is they were having to encounter their most primal fears. So it was assumed right from the go-get that these were all adults and they were all going to be terrified and face challenges. And of course, the, the other premise was the mounting psychological pressures might send some of them a bit crazy. <laughs> so I'll leave it to you if you want to, to try and access that yourself if you're interested. Very different, very different TV series made by the BBC was for children, preschool children, very young children. And it's called In the Night Garden. And it's about this idea that as day fades and it becomes night, there is this magical night garden that appears and this group of toys come out to play. It's not quite night in the photograph, but that's, that's the toys in the series. And the program seems to be, it's, it's not quite explicitly stated, but the message seems to be encouraging people, encouraging children not to be afraid of the dark, but at the same time that the dark is playtime. And I'm not sure that the parents are that keen on that message because most parents are trying to get the children to sleep at night, not to get up and play. But I thought it was a nice idea because darkness is seen as something not to be feared, but as something, a place of adventure and play. And the last one I mentioned here is a film, a recent film um, set in a small town in the desert in the US and it's a junior stargazing event. And it's, it's an interesting film, but near the end of the film, the event is disrupted by the arrival of an alien and that kind of throws everyone in a tizzy. Everyone gets a bit kind of freaked out by this, this being arriving. So I don't think there'll ever not be depictions of darkness and dark skies in the media. And it's interesting that the children's one um, is taking quite a different spin on children's fear of darkness. Because one of the things I noticed as I was looking into children and darkness is there are many, many companies and products that promote night lights and stick on stars, illuminated stars for the ceilings, for children's bedrooms, and all kinds of things that are supposed to help children not get used to being in darkness, I guess, which seems a shame because perhaps that's a really useful lesson to learn when you're a child, that darkness isn't something to be feared. And that that kind of brings me on to, to Sark and the time I spent in Sark. So just a brief intro, many of you probably know, Sark is a small island that became Europe's first international dark sky community 12 years ago. And my MA research I did back in 2013, so that's, that's quite a while back now. But a big thing for me when I went to Sark, and I, I have a friend there and I actually visited every year for nine years, 
but the research was done in 2014. The first thing I had to confront when I went to Sark was my own fear. Because Sark has no streetlights, it has no cars, it has no motorised transport, other than a few tractors that farmers have to get special permission to use. So it's an extremely dark place. And I, I had to confront my own fears because even though I enjoy being in the dark, I nothing had prepared me for just how dark the sark is. So during the research, I sorry, that's just a quick picture of sark. It's very green, as you can see. And it has its own little wooden observatory that were that was built by the local community. But I thought it might be useful just to take a quick look at some of the things that people told me about living on Sark and several participants in my research had spent you know fairly lengthy periods of time in cities and urban areas so they arrived in Sark with a level of fear but most of them quickly became confident in the dark so here's a couple of quotes when I moved here I had to train myself not to be scared now I feel 100% safe and it wasn't the people of the things I was afraid of. It was just so black. And that was certainly my own experience of Sark, trying to cycle in pitch blackness and being absolutely terrified that I was going to fall over and not know where I was. But it certainly decreased the more I visited. And for many people, they spoke about, because it was such a small community and they would know most people, if only by sight, then that helped them feel less anxious about being out in the dark. Because they, they would say things like, it's usually, the human, and it's usually the human element that makes you feel unsafe, meaning it's usually the strangers or the people you're not sure of. You haven't got that here. Usually you know most people, especially in winter. It's a bit different in summer, but certainly in winter time, it, there's, there's very few visitors. And people often told stories of having friends visit who were surprised and embarrassed at struggling with the darkness. One of the interviewees laughed when she remembered her visitor. She said he was literally on his hands and knees to see if he could feel the path. It was pitch black. And another friend whose brother was in the army and saw himself as, you know, quite fearful of in general, was frightened to death to leave my house in the dark. So, as, as we mentioned earlier, fear of the dark is still around for many adults. And yet children, because they were brought, if they were brought up in Sark, they were brought up in an atmosphere where it was perfectly normal to play outside in the dark, to live without streetlights, to be taught what you, you saw up in the night sky. And here, here's a few typical quotes. And if an area was dark, then it was dangerous. That was a message someone had when they were growing up. But she didn't feel it applied there because it was such a small community. And the last quote there was, was very typical. Lots of people spoke about the sense of comfort that they got looking at the dark sky. A certain kind of comfort when you've had a bad day powerful, transformative. So for people in Sark, perhaps not right away, but certainly after a while, and, and people who'd lived there for all their lives, fear of the dark definitely wasn't anything like what I've seen in cities and towns. Very few people were afraid of the dark. It, they were very comfortable walking outside. They could recognise many things things in the night sky. They might not be 100% um, knowledgeable about all the, the stars and the planets, but they could certainly recognise quite a few constellations. But when you, when you, if you think about fear of the dark as a spectrum, then some people, for the reasons we mentioned earlier, whether it's experiences they've had in the past or their upbringing or, or whatever, Fear of the dark becomes very powerful. It becomes a phobia, what's often called nectophobia. And you've, the cliche 
There's people, you know, checking their bed before they go under the bed, before they go to sleep at night, having lots and lots of night lights on, being very, very anxious about being outdoors. The monsters are under the bed. But there's another fear that I wanted to just touch on here tonight, and that's astrophobia. And even though many of us, and I, I know I'm talking, preaching to the converted here, we can stand outside, we can look at a night sky and really appreciate the beauty of that. For some people, it's very frightening. And that's astrophobia, this idea that they look up, they look out, and there's a sense of overwhelm and panic. There's a real fear of what is out there, not knowing what's out there, finding it really hard to conceptualise something so vast that they feel insignificant and, and terrified. Maybe even fearful of aliens, and I'll touch on that in a minute. These two quotes from Sartre, one person talked about being out in the dark, the horizon disappearing. I'm in it and I feel enveloped, part of it. She loved it. She really, really welcomed dark skies. Another person who was a relatively new resident in Sark found it really frightening still. You don't know where you are, no horizon. You can't place yourself. She felt very overwhelmed. Maybe not quite virgin on astrophobia, but yeah, she was certainly still very fearful. And if we think of astrophobia as this idea of a severe and irrational fear of stars and space, and it's, for many people, it is strongly connected to this fear of aliens. So films like Alien and Gravity, they, they play into this idea of it's, there's something out there that's, that's threatening, that's fearful. And they play into this idea of some kind of doomsday scenario often. Whereas gravity is slightly different, it, it really addresses that theme of space being this cold, empty, overwhelming thing. And astrophobia, for some people, can also stem from this a fear of space exploration, triggered by real catastrophes, such as the Space Shuttle, Shuttle's Challenger in Columbia, and, and the film you've maybe seen, Apollo 13, that, that talks about that the real dangers associated with the space programme. So I'm just aware of time and I'm just going to um, show a couple more slides here. But crime at night, it's, it's a huge topic and it's vastly debated. There's still to this day no definite proven link between lighting levels and crime rates, as I'm sure you all know. And this, this piece I've put up here, um, talks about the recent switch-offs and dimming after midnight by more than half of Britain's local councils showed that darkness didn't increase crime, it actually seemed to reduce it. And in 2015, this, this study reported on an analysis that was done over 14 years, they found no evidence of a link between reduced street lighting crime and nighttime vehicle collisions. So, there's many, many studies like this that some will say, yes, it, it depends on various um, factors. I quite like this, this line down here. The only thing that can be said for certain is that the common assumption that light will always deter criminals is incorrect. Dr. Dar Darren Basco talks about lights are perceived to be able to help good people but hinder bad people as if the streetlights have some sort of artificial intelligence in order to differentiate between the two. So, to light the night, question. Coppell and Lopeman caution against excessively dark, severe dark sky laws, because they suggest some individuals may resist giving up particular types of lighting for fear of increased crime or loss of privacy. And the argument that dark skies could be detrimental to human well-being and safety is obviously, not, not obviously, but disclaimed by the IDA, International Dark Sky Association. 
who, who would contest that outdoor and nighttime lighting doesn't necessarily prevent crime. And there, there's many other um, reports that show the same. So just beginning to reach an end now, you've maybe heard, heard of Paul Bogart. He's, he's written several books around darkness. I, I like this quote from him. For most of us, we no longer fear the attacks by wild animals that perhaps our ancestors might have done, I guess. The deadly terrain or the fire at night, nor do we recall our last encounter with a highwayman. And while we love them in movies, we don't normally fear you're meeting witches, ghosts, or werewolves in the dark, or at least we don't admit we do. No, now we fear each other. With all our lights, we push away our fear, and by, push by pushing away our fear, we are a little less alive. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen there, and Come back into the room hopefully yep Good. yeah well thank you so much ada i really really loved your presentation i've loved all of them always but uh th this one they just keep getting better and better so thank you so much for for sharing that with all of us today i feel like i really resonated uh with a lot of what you said uh especially in the beginning that like fear of isolation is not mm -hmm. really being, you know, kind of being one of the roots of the fear of the dark. And as like an only child growing up and being alone in my room at night, I was definitely scared of the dark. And I think that's probably more of what I was scared of was just being alone. And um, I'm still scared of the dark to this day, even working for Dark Sky International. <laughs> and I also really liked what you said about um, that one quote about you know, kind of getting a thrill of the fear of the dark and that can cause people to to love the night sky. And I think that's what's so, um, what kind of keeps me going for astrophotography is I get like, I get to face those fears and I feel like facing those fears kind of makes me stronger in a lot of other aspects of life by facing that fear of the dark. And um, yeah, just a lot of stuff that you said was super interesting and I feel like really relevant. So thank you for sharing. And I will start giving you some questions now. So the first one that I have is actually from our board president, Tom Reinert, and he has a two-part question. So the first is, could you comment on one, the European history of two sleeps with a period of nighttime activity and two, Nighttime is a period of spiritual activity and prayer. See Clark Strand waking up in the dark. Mm, so I'll, answer, I'll speak to the first part first and the two part sleep. I'm, I'm quite fascinated by that because in, um, I don't think I've got his book here, but A. Roger Erkic's book, he, he speaks quite a lot about this idea of the two parts. Well, it's not an idea, it, it was a reality. Um, there was a time, um, probably not in the too distant past, a couple hundred years back, where it was not unknown. In before street lighting, it was it was certainly pretty common that people would go to sleep when it was no longer light enough to do productive work, and they would they would often want to limit the use of candles as well. So they would go to sleep. They would get some rest, maybe for four or five hours. And then it was perfectly normal to wake up and to do some other other activities, whatever that might be. Some of it might be chores. Some of it might be visiting a neighbour, apparently. Um, Roger Arkic talks quite a bit about the different activities that went in during that, on during that time. But I do, I do wonder about that because as a therapist, I quite often speak with people who have sleeping issues and it's very common for people who've got sleeping problems to sleep for three or four hours and then wake up quite naturally, but then feel that they shouldn't be awake. So end up you know, feeling really stressed and anxious about being awake during the night <clears throat> and trying all kinds of things to get to sleep. And then eventually maybe get to sleep. But perhaps biologically, it's <laughs> it would be more helpful if they just gave in to the idea of the two sleeps. Huh. 
So they do that visiting their neighbor and everything in the dark. Apparently that used to happen, oh. yes. And cool. it's an, on Sark, you know, people do that. People, I want to go were... to Sark so bad. Like, I, just, <laughs> I was like Googling it when you were talking about it. I was like, wow, this seems like a dark sky paradise for sure. I mean, it certainly wasn't unusual in the summer on, on Sark for people to have a sleep earlier in the evening, get themselves some rest, and then get up at midnight, stay up maybe till three in the morning and visit people because it was just such a normal thing to do there. They were <laughs> used to being in the dark. So yes, the two sleeps... It, it, it was certainly very common in, in the UK, I imagine in other societies as well, before 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 lighting. Um, I think there's value in it. I think biologically, probably it's pr quite good for us to have an uninterrupted sleep rather than feeling this pressure to sleep for seven hours. Sorry, Tom, can you, the, sec the second part of the question was about the spiritual activities. Spiritual, or? yeah, there's a lot of tradition of prayer in the middle of the night, even monasteries, you get up in the middle yes. of the night and you pray. And um, some people think it's a particularly psychologically adapted period for spiritual thought. Yes, I mean, I my background, I'm not a Catholic anymore, but I was brought up as a Catholic. And when I was a child, 10, 11, 12, we used to get taken to convents for retreats at weekends. And it was it was part of what we did. We got woken during the night by the nuns for certain um, prayers and things during the night. And if you're a 10 year old, it's really exciting getting woken during the night and told to go and sit with candles. But what we were told, certainly by the nuns, was that it was a time where there was less distraction from the everyday world that you were more likely to be able to focus and that there was more of a chance of having a connection to a God. So yeah, I would agree there does, there's a lot of traditions of being closer to a deity um, when there's less mundane worldly distraction. And yeah, it's not an area I know very much about, but I'd be interested in that, that book you mentioned too. I must look into that. Thanks, Ada and Tom. Uh, Aaron Watson from Colorado has a question. How does light slash dark contrast play into fear? Going from a brightly lit area into darkness, it's hard to see. So I become scared. But when I finally am dark adapted, I can see just fine and have no fear. In other words, does exposure to light create a perceived fear of darkness when really it is a fear of the contrast between light and dark? I know that's something Tim Edensor is really interested in. He writes quite a lot about the period between light and dark, or dusk, as we often we often call it. Um, but even just going from a light environment to a dark environment, or vice versa. I, I think I think there's something about the jolt. I, I read something once about you know what it does to the retina when it's impacted by light. It actually does cause a physiological fear response from light to dark, but for some reason, for some people, it works the opposite way around, if that makes sense. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to, <laughs> there's a lot of questions. People are really interested in this subject, so I'm trying to get through all of them here and make sure I'm addressing them. Um, we have a question here from Meryl, who says, if we look at fear of the dark from an evolutionary perspective, isn't it true that bad things tended to happen at night to our ancient ancestors as fear of the night, like fear of large predators, including other humans, is baked into our DNA? Those who were feel fearful were more likely to survive. While an evolutionary perspective should never be an excuse for giving up on fear, could it help in some way to know our evolutionary past? I, I would completely agree. I... I think, you know, evolutionary fears come from a real place, from real events. And, you know, thinking about our ancestors were usually living in much more dangerous circumstances where predators were more likely, neighboring tribes perhaps could attack under cover of darkness. You know, the, the actual terrain they were living in was much more severe. So if you can't see the dangers, then of course, you know, you have to be alert and very real fears. People could be taken away under cover of darkness. 
so yeah the evolutionary you know it, it evolved from real dangers that were present so absolutely i would agree we need to be mindful of that okay. but also remind ourselves that these days the, the predators are different <laughs> and mm -hmm. we do have more control not all of us but many of us over our environment and we do have choices as well so we don't have to necessarily still live in that state of fight or flight that our ancestors had to to stay safe all right so bill has a question and he's talking about you know we talked a lot about um evolutionary adaptation childhood trauma isolation media representation as some of the reasons um, but that there also are realistic motives to be scared of the dark, like difficulty avoiding hazards and crimes and compromised privacy, et cetera. Um, and he's wondering if we are to convince cities, schools, and individuals to use less night at light at night, how do we proceed in that? I, I think it's got to be a balance because I think it's important that people do keep themselves safe and are mindful of um you know, very real dangers of being in the dark. And, you know, there are pitfalls, literally. You, you know, we are we are more likely to trip over and fall in the dark <laughs> if we can't see where we're walking. And I, I know, I mean, I'm going to go back to the, the SARC experiences. On SARC, it was very common for children as part of a normal um, school week to be taken out on night walks by teachers. So that way, children were becoming familiarized with being outdoors at night. That's not something I've come across in cities and towns much at all. Generally, parents dissuade children from going out at night. There's not that many parents I know of who would take young children out on a dark night, which is such a pity because imagine what they could open them up to showing them. So I think some of it comes down to childhood and familiarizing childhood children with darkness, helping them feel comfortable and safe, taking, you know, necessary precautions. So getting that balance, um, because I think once you can get captive audiences of children looking up at a night sky and showing them the amazing things that can be seen up there, you've got potentially an adult who's going to be less fearful as well. Yeah. And, and I will just add to that as well. Um, I think a lot of the perception of the dark sky movement is we want to be Sark. We want no street lights, right? We want to complete darkness, but I agree with you, Ada, that there is, there is a balance and it's not about always necessarily using just no light or very, very dim light. It's about using better lighting that, that is better designed and doesn't shine into your neighbor's window or up into the sky. And we can still have some of this dark sky friendly lighting coexisting with the ability to go out and experience darkness as well. Um, so I, I like this question from Nathan. He asks, I love any insights on transitioning my four-year-old off of her nightlight in a non-traumatic way. <laughs> so I, maybe this is something you, you've already thought of trying, but, but one method that you can try is that you, you sit with your child and you play a game and you, you sit with the nightlight on at first and then you say, let's both close our eyes so you're, the main thing is you're accompanying them. You're not leaving the room. You sit, you, you turn the light out, you both close your eyes. And then you, you say to your child, how about we put our hands over our eyes like this? And we open our eyes with our hands on our eyes. And you get them to kind of play around like that with you sitting beside them. And for some children, that helps them get used to the idea of having their eyes open and closed in the dark. And But it's a transition. You wouldn't immediately re take the light, night light out and you would always stay with them for a while while you were playing this game. And then you would put the night light on again. But then the next night, you would reduce the amount of time you had the night light on. So it would be a phased reduction accompanied with the game. I will say that I slept with the nightlight on until I was like 29 and I'm 30 now. So 
I mean, I I was okay. I was still okay, even with the nightlight. And I still love the dark, but there was something so comforting about just like a little bit of of light in, in the room. So, um, but now I do sleep in the darkness. So, so it might take you 30 years, Nathan, but I'm sure that there will be a transition eventually. Um, so, and I think Diane has a really good and practical question. She says, what are some ways to get over being afraid of the dark besides therapy? Uh, there's a suggestion to, you know, go to where you're going to go at night during the day first and look around, um, or, you know, stay by your car, bring a dog, play music. Uh, do you have any other suggestions or ways to help people maybe feel more comfortable in the dark? I'm not a huge fan. If, if you mean playing music as in having headphones on, if that's what you mean, I'm not a huge fan of that because I think I like the idea of, being in the dark and trying to use as many senses as possible so that you're picking up as much as possible, as much messages as possible from the environment. So I, going going with a friend, it doesn't have to be an official, you know, dark skywalk or anything like that. Just asking a friend if, what they would feel about just going for short walks at night, starting off early evening, not waiting until it's, you know, one o'clock in the morning and, and very dark because sometimes we have this perception that there's darkness and there's light and there's nothing in between mm -hmm. it's actually a transitional time there's dusk there's you know if it's if it's a full moon night it's actually quite bright <laughs> in some places oh right yeah so i i'd suggest the best thing would be to find a willing friend who's willing to accompany you and go short walks and also even when you're in your house even before you go outside getting used to putting a light out in your room and looking out of your house, um, noticing what you see, and picking familiar places. Absolutely, go somewhere that you've checked out during the day so that you know roughly what the terrain is like. That will help you more feel comfortable and safe. Yeah, yeah thank you. And I, th I think going out with a little moonlight is a really great suggestion as well, because um, it's surprising how bright the moon is. I call it the night sun. It's so, it's so bright when it's full. It really feels like a totally different experience than a moonless night. Um, okay. We have, there's, I, there's a lot of questions, but I'm going to just put these last two that I have together because they're both kind of similar and then we'll wrap up because we have just a few more minutes. Uh, but these two are kind of related. Someone's asking about prolactin as being a spiritual or calming hormone and that in order to access that we need eight to nine hours of darkness and not just sleep and then kind of linked to that spiritualness uh, Meredith asks about kind of how the religious symbolism of light and dark plays into our fear of the dark as well. Prolactin I can't really speak to that I'm, I'm not, yeah, I can't, I don't know enough about that to comment other than in terms of how much sleep we all need. I think it's, it's not quite so clear cut. Some people certainly seem to be able to function really well and stay well physically and mentally with less than eight to 10 hours. So I'm afraid I can't really comment much on that, that hormone. Sorry, that's all I could say. Okay, no, no worries. Um, yeah, but maybe you can speak to Mary this question, kind of just about you know the how we see light and dark, especially in like religious context in our society, and how that may play into to our fear. Well, you know, when you think of many many religions and spiritual traditions throughout the globe, darkness is often associated with um, whether it you know evil or paganism paganism in the kind of diabolic sense not in the wider sense of paganism it's often associated with with the dark literally the dark side so there's there's many many pieces of research and books out there around and, and again i would go back to roger arkich his, his book is good on this as well um and he, you know in, in terms of christianity there was this right back to the very beginning there's this idea of you know in the darkness and then there was light 
and Jesus Christ was often referred to as the light of the world. And, and many other religions talk about um, darkness as something to be avoided. Carl Jung was very interested in that idea, the psychoanalyst, the psychiatrist, about how people conceive the dark side. And he talked about the shadow side of our personalities as well. So there's a, there's, that's a huge topic in itself, that whole idea of light and dark. And nothing is ever quite black and white, is it? There's always no. shades of <laughs> No, I love that analogy. Um, well, we are at the top of the hour. Sorry, Suze. Um, and I just wanted to ask, would you be comfortable sharing your slides with us so we could share them with, with people here? Uh, I know yeah. a lot of people wanted to see those uh, quotes again or some of those articles that were linked. So we can get that from you, Ada. Thank you. And, and send that out with the recording as well. Yeah. We had a ton of interaction and questions and comments in the chat. So thank you so much for sharing in information on this important topic. It's very needed to address in in our world, in our field of dark skies. We literally start our name with dark. So it's definitely important to address how people feel and conceive about dark. And I think you've shed a lot of light on that for us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that. And I will just mention if you do like, did like this presentation and you want to continue being involved in dark sky, I would highly recommend joining the dark sky advocates network. If you're not already a part of it, we also do monthly meetings on different dark sky topics uh, usually a little bit more action oriented to help you kind of get active and involved in your community. So if Michael can pop that link in the chat for me, that would be awesome. And we would, would love to see you all be a part of that. So Ada, again, a huge thank you. Do you have any parting words you would like to leave us with today? Just get out there and enjoy the dark. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Having me company. <laughs> thank you all so much for joining us today and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye.